today on Grace To You. Put your faith in Jesus Christ is the message of the book of Hebrews. That's the foundation of our faith. We believe God is who He is, and we believe He rewards those who put their trust in Him. Only one way to please God, and that's to believe Him. What that means is to believe His Word. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The 11th chapter of Hebrews, you can turn to it if you want, is known by many names. Uh, it is called the Hall of Fame. It is called the Heroes of Faith. It is called the Honor Roll of the Saints. It is called the Faith Chapter. And it has even been called the Westminster Abbey of Scripture because it has uh, so many of the testimonies of those who uh, have been basically immortalized in stained glass. I want you to look at Hebrews 11, but back up to the 10th chapter and verse 38. And I want to read just uh, five verses, verses 38, 39, and then 1, 2, and 3. Hebrews 10, 38, "'But My righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, My soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul." Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. We have at the end of chapter 10 a very familiar statement, the just shall live by faith, the righteous one shall live by faith. That first is laid out in Scripture back in the prophet Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. It is repeated again by Paul in Romans and in Galatians, and here it appears again in the book of Hebrews. And we understand that. The just shall live by faith. Salvation is by faith and faith alone. That is at the very heart of all of our understanding of the gospel. Now let me help you to kind of flow into this section a little bit. It fits perfectly into this epistle. In the first ten chapters, the writer has been laboring to prove one point. Ten chapters to make one point, and that is that the new covenant in the blood of Christ, the new covenant in Jesus' blood is completely and in every way superior to the old covenant which was marked by the blood of animals. Let me say it again. The new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ is completely and in every way superior to the old covenant which was marked by animal blood. The writer of Hebrews, whom we can't be certain as to his identity, but the writer has basically demonstrated to us that Jesus is better than everything connected to the old covenant. He is better than angels. He is better than prophets. He is better than Moses. He is better than Aaron. He is better than Joshua. He is a better priest than any previous priest, and He is a better sacrifice than any previous sacrifice, and He is the one who seals a better covenant. The message of the first ten chapters is put your faith in Jesus Christ. Move on from the symbolism of the old covenant to the new covenant in Christ. At periodic times through this epistle, at least four times already by the time you get to chapter 10, there is a warning. 
And that warning is given to the readers of this epistle. And the warning is this, come all the way to Christ. Come all the way to Christ. Don't turn back. Don't neglect to come to Christ. Don't neglect the salvation, chapter 2. Enter into the rest that is available to you. Having heard all there is to hear about Christ, don't walk away. Don't turn away, chapter 6, or it's impossible for you to be renewed again to repentance. And here we find it again in chapter 10, verse 38. Don't come close to Christ and then shrink back. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction. What's going on here is the, uh, the apostle who wrote this, or the writer who is associated with the apostle, some of the apostles, is basically saying to Jewish people, that's why it's called Hebrews, you have heard about Christ, you have somehow connected yourself to the church of Jesus Christ, you're around, you're interested, you're close, come all the way to Christ. Because the Old Testament said, the just shall live by faith. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Salvation was always by faith. This is the only way anyone was ever saved from the beginning of redemption to the end. Any system of salvation by works, by effort, by doing something, by earning it is a satanic counterfeit of the truth. So what you had in first century Judaism was not the true Old Testament religion of faith. That it was a heretical, satanic system of works righteousness that had turned grace and faith on its head and replaced it with works. False forms of Judaism and false forms of Christianity are based on satanically twisted Scripture. The Bible is clear, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Salvation is by faith. Jews were counting on their works. So after ten chapters of showing the superiority of Christ, at the end of chapter 10, the writer says, the righteous one shall live by faith, a direct quote out of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Come all the way to Christ by faith. Don't turn around and walk back. Again, they were warned in chapter 2, they were warned in chapter 4, they were warned in chapter 6, and here for the first, fourth time in chapter 10, the severe warning back in verse 29 and another warning at the end of the chapter. Faith is the only way to God. Come to Christ by faith. Through Him is the only way to God. Now what do we mean by faith? And that is the reason for chapter 11. Because we have immediately in chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You will notice that it's nothing to do with works or effort or ceremony or sacrament. What you have here is a definition of faith, just a simple basic definition of faith. And then after that definition in the opening couple of verses, you have literally one illustration after another, after another, after another, after another of people who lived and received salvation by faith, and all of them are Old Testament people. And this is to say to these Jewish believers, come all the way to faith. Come all the way to faith as Abel did, as Enoch did, as Noah did, as Abraham did, as Sarah did. Come all the way to faith as Isaac did, as Jacob did, as Joseph did, as Moses did. Come all the way to faith as Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, on and on. They're all models of salvation by faith. And so you have in the opening couple of verses a simple declaration of what faith is, then these powerful, dramatic illustrations of that faith 
in all these characters that are listed here. Now how important is it that these are all Old Testament personalities? Because that is the point to the Jews. God has always saved and only saved by faith. And you see it in the record of the Old Testament. Now I want to show you three things in these opening three verses. I want to talk about the nature of faith, the testimony of faith, and the illustration of faith. Let's look at the nature of faith. Verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now this is not a comprehensive, fully orbed theological definition of faith, but it is essentially a declaration. Rather than a definition, it's a declaration. And it defines faith in two ways. Faith, the Greek word pistis, which is all over the New Testament, means belief, trust, faith. Faith can be defined in these two ways. It is the assurance of things hoped for, and it is the conviction of things not seen. Now those are very, very close to being synonymous statements. But let's see if we can't pull them apart a little bit. First of all, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the authorized says, NAS says, the assurance of things hoped for. I like the word substance, and that gives us some kind of handle to get a grip on this word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith takes something hoped for but not realized and gives it substance. We have faith. But, but our faith has substance. It has body. It has weight. We have faith in things hoped for, things we don't possess, things we haven't seen, things yet to come. But faith gives them present substance, present reality. And as this chapter will show, and in Old Testament times there were many men and, as we will see, many women who had nothing but promises, nothing but promises. In fact, all of them had nothing but promises. Look at the end of chapter 11, verse 39. All these, having gained approval by God through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Those people lived in promises they never, ever saw. That is the characteristic of all the people in this chapter. Look for example at chapter 11, verse 26, it's a remarkable statement about Moses. It says, Moses, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. He was willing to give up the in-hand treasures of Egypt as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was willing to give up what he had in his hand of Egyptian wealth for Christ, Christ who was merely a messianic hope. But the hope was so powerful. The promise was so secure and sure that it had substance, that it had weight, and he was glad to let go of what he had in his hand for what would come in the future only by way of promise. In other words, like Moses, all the rest of these people in chapter 11 were people of faith, and faith was trust in God's promise for the future as yet unrealized, but having so much weight and so much substance that you bank your life on it. They took God at His Word. And herein lies the foundation of all true and genuine saving faith. You must believe the revelation of God. In the book of um, Daniel, you have the young men Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego confronted with the choice. And their choice was to obey Nebuchadnezzar, whom they could see and to worship the king whom they could see or obey God whom they could not see and trust God by walking into a fiery furnace. 
without any hesitation, they chose to believe in God, even though the king was real and the king was visible and God was invisible and God was only apprehended by faith, but God had revealed Himself in His Word and they believed in His Word. And so they walked right into the fiery furnace. Christian has no doubt, really, that it is better to stake everything on the realities of our invisible God than to trust in everything in this visible world. So faith is contramundo. It's, it's against the world and how the world operates, and it's part of what makes us so alien from the world around us. Now Christian hope or Christian faith is belief in God not only against the world but against the senses, against the senses. People in general would say, I, I want what I can lay my hands on. I want what I can taste and touch and hold. The senses tell us to grasp the thing that's there in the moment, very different than Christians. We read in verse 6 in Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. You want to come to God, you have to believe that He is even though you've never seen Him. You not only have to believe that He is, but you have to believe that He is a rewarder of those who come to Him. That's the foundation of our faith. We believe God is who He is, and we believe He rewards those who put their trust in Him. That's in verse 6, sums it all up. We believe that He is, and we be believe that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That's how we live our life. We don't live our life by the touch and the feel and the hearing and the seeing of the senses, but rather by the promises of God in His Word. So Christian hope is against the world and it's against the senses. And thirdly, I would just say, just to kind of spread it out a little bit, Christian hope is belief against the present. Belief against the present, just another way to look at it. The Christian sacrifices the pleasure of the present for the promises of the future. As a kid, my father had a famous saying that he fired at me regularly as a kid. He would say to me, Johnny, why do you always sacrifice the future on the altar of the immediate? Why do you always sacrifice the future on the altar of the immediate? It was very hard for me as a young person to be able to put off gratification into the future and make small investments in what would be a rich future instead of grabbing at everything tangible in the moment it was stuck in front of me. That's what people in the world do. People think that the future is uncertain. We know better. We know the whole history of the universe, right? It's all laid out in Scripture. We know exactly what's going to happen because it's revealed in the Word of God, and the Bible has a perfect track record. Everything it's ever said throughout all of its Genesis to Revelation, everything that it's ever said that can be verified in human history or in human behavior or human experience has proven to be true. And so we believe in the Word of God, and by faith we trust that Word. So real faith is this substantial trust in the promises of God. Faith takes that future promise and pulls it into present reality and gives it weight in our lives. And the second thing he says in verse 1, faith is the conviction of things not seen. This takes it to a to a greater intensity. It's not just hoping. It, it's not just hoping for something. It's not just strongly hoping for it. It is the conviction that it is true. The Lucas just means that. An absolute conviction implied there is that this is an unwavering confidence. This just pushes it one step further than the idea that it has weight and substance, that we believe it, it is a firm conviction. It is that firm conviction that allowed martyrs to be burned at the stake and never waver. Faith is living on the basis of things not seen, 
and being so sure of them that they become your convictions. And now we've moved from what you believe to how you behave because you live by your convictions. And you can go back to chapter 11, verse 27, back to the verse after the one we read earlier about Moses. Moses was willing to take the reproach of Christ over the riches of Egypt because his faith was in the coming Messiah. But notice how that showed up in practicality. Verse 27, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Moses left Egypt, and he was the adopted son of the princess. He left Egypt to go out into the wilderness, and that is to say his faith not only had weight and substance in his believing it, but it had enough conviction to move him in the direction that he ought to go. That's what we mean by conviction. Or you could look at the illustration of Noah, and you'll have the opportunity to do that. Chapter 7 talks about Noah. Well, let me just remind you of Noah. There was no such thing as rain. So God says to Noah, it's going to rain. And Noah says, it's going to what? It's going to rain like water's going to come out of the sky. Really? You have to trust Me for that. It's not going to rain for a long time, 120 years, but it's going to rain. Now, uh, never having seen rain, he could visualize it because there was water. But Noah believed God that it was going to rain. He not only believed God it was going to rain, he believed God was going to bring so much rain it would drown the entire population of the whole earth. And that the only way that he could ever escape and his wife and his three sons and their wives was to build a boat in the middle of the desert. It's going to rain, it's never rained. It's going to float a boat in the middle of the desert. This is rain beyond comprehension. It's going to drown the entire planet. So what did He do? He built a boat. For a hundred and twenty years He built that. To those of us who are believers, the invisible spiritual and future things revealed in God's Word are real, and they have weight, and they control how we behave. So that's essentially the nature of faith. Let's talk about the testimony of faith in verse 2. For by it the men of old gained approval. Men of old means the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament fathers that, and mothers, I guess you could say, that are listed throughout this whole chapter. For by it the men of old gained approval. The Greek verb means to be praised, to be approved. Then you have a listing of many of those who were approved, approved by God, approved by God. Now let me remind you of something. There's only one way to please God, only one way. Go back to verse 6, verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to do what? To please Him. So there's only one way to please God, and that's by faith. So all these people in the Old Testament who believed God, and it became not only substantial faith, but it became conviction, and it controlled their conduct, they gained approval from God because the only way you can gain approval from God is by faith. Abraham and Sarah believed God for a child, and out of their loins a nation, and God fulfilled His promise. And Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, Amram, Jochebed, Moses, Joshua. Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, they all believed God, and they're all approved by God, and they're all heroes in the hall of fame of this chapter. They trusted what they couldn't see, they bet their life on it, and God approved of that faith. There's only one way, only one way to please God, and that's to believe Him. And what that means is to believe His Word. Here's the illustration of faith. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. 
That, that is just such a comprehensive statement. By faith we understand the worlds were prepared by the Word of God. Can I see something obvious? Was anybody there when God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1 and 2? No. Um, God created everything, ex nihilo in the Latin, out of nothing, created everything out of nothing. There was nothing but God, and He created everything out of nothing, and that's what it is saying. By His Word, Genesis 1, and God said, 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 day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God said, and it was so. God spoke creation into being. By faith, we understand that. We know that the worlds were prepared by the rhema of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So what we see in the universe is not the product of billions of years of stuff shaping into what we now see. What we now see is exactly what God created in six days. If you believe that, you are a person of faith, and God is well pleased. I want to talk to you for a few moments about the subject of faith. That's the subject of Hebrews chapter 11. But I want to talk to you about that from a perspective that may seem a little strange. Um, I've written a book called Hard to Believe. It is hard to believe. We, we call people to faith. We, we cry out to people, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We ask the sinners to repent and believe, but it's hard. How hard is it? Well, from a human standpoint, it's actually impossible because the sinner is dead, blind, hopeless, double-blinded by Satan. The sinner loves to sin, can't understand the things of God, so he's trapped and bound. And that's why I, I titled the book, Hard to Believe. It is hard to believe. In fact, it's actually, from a human standpoint, impossible to believe. And Jesus expressed it this way, it would be easier to put a camel through the eye of a needle than for someone to gain salvation by any act of his own will. How amazing is that? We're called to believe, and yet that's impossible. It is hard to believe so hard that it can only happen when God does a divine miracle in the sinner's heart. I'd be very, very encouraged, and so would you, if you would get a copy of Hard to Believe and see how what is impossible with men is possible with God.